Thank you, Abba. Lord, we are grateful for every moment that you give us to be together. We don't take for granted these times. We don't take for granted the opportunity to encourage one another and inspire one another to live uprightly and righteously in this present hour. Lord, we just want you, we need you, we desire you. We look to you this morning to further uh, the deepening in our hearts for all things truth, not so that we can just spout it out, but that we live it out, that we become true. And so, Lord, every aspect that you want to hardwire into us again today, we say yes and amen. We thank you for the glory of who you are and that we were created to be carriers of that glory. And I ask you, Lord, come in your marvelous light and enlighten us. Come on the inside and fill us with light. In the name of Yeshua, amen. Well, Jason, our dear brother, had a scripture that he was carrying that whole time we were praying for him. And I want to read it because it is exactly New Bible. Can't find what you're looking for. Not enough highlights yet. This is Joel chapter 2. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing infants. Pretty much takes care of everybody. Let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chamber. Let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your inheritance a reproach a byword among the nations. Why should they among the people say, where is their God? Can't think of a more appropriate passage for us as we gather. We are literally wanting that testimony to be resident in this house. We want the people of Bimbrook, we want the people of Dallas-Fort Worth to come under the influence of God's glory. And the more we expose ourselves to that, the more we are receptive to that, the greater atmospheric change that can take place. And we get to live this out so that that testimony becomes real and alive uh, to all of us. Um, I love how the Lord... Uh, orchestrates things, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, is the orchestration of God. You know, I have my plans. He has his. Sometimes he has to remind me of that. This is one of those moments. And so um, my orientation is to study. So I study all the time so that in moments like this, I don't have to rely on a very specific set. I simply say, okay, Lord, here's the, here's the you know, well that I've been digging from. What do you want to say? How do you want to say it? And I feel it's important for us this morning to understand God's sovereignty. <laughs> so I'm going to be speaking about that today and how God orchestrates our lives. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term Shemitah, but we are in a Shemitah year, which means that we are in a year of Jubilee. We're in a year of physical rest in the land of Israel so that the land can be replenished. And it's a big deal. You can imagine the, the testimony uh, in the Hebrew people is that every 50th Sabbath year, 
There is a year of jubilee. There is this returning of the land to rest so that it can be cultivated once again. I think it's very interesting that we find ourselves in that position right now as the people of God. We're learning how to step back and trust. If you don't think it doesn't take trust to let the land lay fallow for a year, you're sadly mistaken, you know. But it doesn't mean you're idle during that time. It doesn't mean you're passive during that time. It simply means that you are honoring the Lord because he is the author of creation. So he knows what the land needs. He knows what this land needs, this piece of real estate. And we're learning that orientation. So I want to begin this morning, Jason, with Noah. <laughs> That's your son's name, right? Bless you, Noah. I love your name. Do you know what your name means? It means rest. Think about it. His name means rest. It doesn't take a prophetic ninja to figure out that we are living in the days of Noah. There is so much darkness, so much chaos, so much accusation, you know, so much that is coming uh, from a dimension of the spirit of Leviathan, that twisting, turning, you know, taking truth and twisting it or making something up and, and saying that it's true. We live in that context. Here's what Matthew has to say about that. He says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So, beloved, we cannot excuse away or, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Make, uh, I just said excuse. Uh, we can't passively let that go. We have to understand these are the days in which we live. So we need to understand that the enemy is twisting and distorting and turning and accusing and all of these things. Because what we are being prepared for is the return of the Lord. Now, beloved, whether that's tomorrow, the next day, 10 years, 100 years from now, none of us actually knows. But the precedent of being prepared never changes. Making ourselves ready is the testimony of Revelation chapter 19. It is intentional. You showing up here today is intentional. You're coming to be a part of what God's doing and building and transforming in us as the people of God. I would love for this place to be full today. I believe that day is coming. I just don't know what it's going to take to get that a reality. And that's where I walk in the fear of the Lord. For you, all it took was a moment with the Lord to stir your heart to want to come and be a part of this. And I, I am so, so grateful for this faithful remnant that has come over and over and over and over and over through these 10 months. I understand it's a huge sacrifice. Friday night, all day Saturday, Sunday, first weekend of every month. I understand it's a sacrifice. But I speak for myself in saying that I know the encounters that I've had. I know the wealth that I've drawn from in these last 10 months. And I know the principle of seeds. And I understand that he is returning the ancient seeds so that they can flourish once again in the earth. Did you know that there are chefs in America who have been cultivating, uh, uh, harvesting seeds that are over 100, 200 years old so that they can receive the nourishment that our forerunning people were a part of in these crops. So they have been sowing these seeds once again and are actually harvesting fruits and vegetables from seeds that are over 100, 200 years old. It's pretty cool, huh? Well, guess what? There is an ancient way. There are ancient paths. 
and he's realigning our steps so that we walk those ancient paths. And here's the deal. It, the days of Noah were tumultuous. We all know that. But they will be like that for the Son of Man coming again. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and they were drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. That's a very sobering thing to hear. What that says is that people are so distracted and so self-absorbed and self-centered that they're not looking, listening, applying, concerned in any way about what the Lord is actually doing and saying. And You hear me? Yep. So, beloved, my... Uh, desire this morning is not to emphasize all the negativity of the days of Noah. That's not my point. My point is that to understand God's sovereignty, we have to understand who's in control, who's in authority. And so for Noah, <laughs> it was in his walk with God we just heard Pastor Lynn share a message, right, on who? That Enoch. And what was the testimony of Enoch? Enoch walked with God. This is what your Bible says about Noah. Genesis chapter 6. It's a good thing Genesis is at the beginning. It's easier to find. This is what it says. Well, as soon as I find it. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. We have the same testimony of Noah that we have of Enoch. Noah walked with God. This is a really interesting word in the Hebrew. It's the Hebrew word... Um, Halach, and it describes, it describes a continual, conversant following. So Noah was active in his conversations and intentionality of pursuing this God who would say, go build an ark, it's about to rain. Now that doesn't sound very... Um, difficult or challenging or odd to us because we understand the concept of rain. Yeah. In Noah's day, there was no such thing as rain. Yeah. It had never rained. How do you prepare for something that you don't know? Yeah. Well, you have to trust and you have to be obedient. So I have thought many times about this particular uh, man, Noah, he walked with God, he was conversant, he was actively pursuing and following the Lord, and the Lord makes this request of him in the strongest means possible, go do this, go build an ark. And so year one, probably no problem. Year two, okay, we're getting into it, we're starting to get the beams, and year three, year four, year five, year six. Has anything changed in the world? Has the mocking stopped? Has the, has the evil stopped? Has the darkness removed from the people? No, it's growing in intensity. What are you doing, Noah? What do you think you're doing? What is, what is this that you and your family are, are doing? You're 10, you're 12, you're 20. Did it stop? No, it grew in intensity. The mocking. What are you doing? What is this? 
why are you giving all of your effort and energy to, to building, what is this? And I don't even know what this is. What's it for? And all Noah can say is that the God of heaven told me to build an ark because it's about to rain. <laughs> How do you tell someone about something they know nothing about? You have to live it out. So Noah spends year 50, 60, 70 living this thing out in preparation for that moment when they enter the ark and it begins to rain. Listen, beloved, I don't know what it's going to take to fill houses of worship. I know in the past it's taken things like 9-11. The day after 9-11, Shady Grove Church that I was a part of, we were filled for days on end, people in the sanctuary weeping and wailing and praying and asking God to intervene on behalf of our nation, for the families, for the first responders, for all those involved. We sent teams of people to New York City. It was horrible. God forbid that it takes that again. Let's be the generation that is awakened to the intentionality of walking with God so that we can be prepared. You with me? Let's be that people that know how to carry his presence. Noah was a carrier of his presence. How do I know that? Because he spent time with him. He knew the intentionality of that. So he carried the presence of God. He opened his ears to the voice of God. Beloved, we can quickly and very easily tune out the voice of God in our life when we become so distracting with the mocking voice or the circumstances of life or whatever it is that is going on around us. We can very easily and very quickly tune all those things up and tune out the voice of God especially when he asks something so ridiculous. Come on, I'm just being honest. Following his instructions, in spite of the opposition, is living in the days of Noah. That's what we're called to. But understanding the impartation of his name kept Noah moving forward. Now, how is that possible? How is it possible to embrace the fullness of your name and keep building when your name is rest and you have to work in order to get it done? How does that happen? Where's the rest taking place? <laughs> the rest is in your mind because you know you're being obedient to the word that he spoke. It silences all the lies and it removes that influence from your thinking. The peace of God comes upon your heart as you rest in the knowledge of who he is and what he's asked you to do. The manifestation of rest to our body is that we have now come under the influence of the government of his peace. And we can live in the midst of opposition. We can live in the midst of the mocking and all the things that are taking place. Listen, beloved, it's escalating. December is going to be a very key month in the life of our nation. Please, please, please be praying over the Supreme Court as they dialogue further about this issue of Roe versus Wade. I believe it will be overturned. I believe it should be overturned. I believe it should be sent back to the states where they can actually govern this thing the way it should be governed instead of a national mandate. We've been living under a curse of death 
for all of these years. And the only way for life to flourish is to remove that curse. It's on tape. I don't care. But saying that only enrages the enemy. And that rage is growing and coming. So when that rage comes, are we going to be able to stand as in the days of Noah and rest in our thoughts and in our heart and in our actions, knowing that we've been asked to speak the truth, to carry the testimony of Yeshua, that he's the giver of life. He's the life giver. Not a culture of death, a culture of life. Noah's walk with God, this halach, this intentional, conversational pursuit, carried him through a hundred years of chaos, a hundred years of opposi opposition and resistant culture, listening and obeying through it all. That's what I want you to hear this morning as we start this explorative discussion on sovereignty. God is sovereign. And we're going to look at some uh, biblical texts this morning as we consider that. But I want to take a moment and let's just pray because the reality is we know that we're living in these days. We're living in the days of Noah where this is actually happening. These are the birth pangs. These are the constrictions. Is that the right word? Yes, thank you. Contractions, thank you. Constricting is for snakes. We, we don't do snakes here. <laughs> Contractions. As they intensify and we understand the pressure that's needed, we cannot see that from an ungodly perspective. That's where conspiracy theories and all that stuff comes from. We have to see the, con uh, the contractions and the pressure as the transformational opportunity that God is giving us to come forward into the glory of God and to be that testimony on the face of the earth that there is a God, he is alive and active, and he's coming back. We get to be that people. So, Lord, even as our nation is winding itself up with such discord and chaos, with such hatred and even violence, Lord, where uh, the front lines of the media are actually giving themselves over to the twisting and distorting of truth, we, we, Lord, we increasingly need to know how to enter this rhythm of rest, how to live this out uh, and not get tired and weary and fall back into the, uh, the pits of complacency or even busyness that will dry up our spiritual life. We declare this is a year of awakening. Yes. Lord, we even prophesy over this house, over our nation, that this is a year of awakening. It's a year of preparing the soil of our heart so that it can be tilled and labored for harvest. Lord, we believe it. Lord, we're asking for new levels of trust with you and with one another so that we can prepare to multiply in this next season. Let us not grow weary in well-doing. Please, Lord, don't let us become weary in well-doing. Let us stay engaged, continually pursuing, because awakening is coming. And we declare it in the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. I want to talk for a few minutes about Daniel.
Historically, we know that Daniel was about 14, 15, 16 years of age when the enemy besieged his city. It's a very vulnerable age. Daniel watched his city burn. He watched his parents, brothers, sisters, friends. He saw them slaughtered. He was carried away to a foreign land. He was remanded to serve the murderers of his people. He was robbed of his manhood, stripped down to the barest bone of human existence. You are going to serve a foreign king. What would you have thought of God in such a plight? What would be your thoughts? How would you have responded? Where would you fit God's sovereignty into that story? Well, here's what Daniel had to say about that. Daniel chapter 1, verse 2. Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. That's Daniel's perspective as a 14, 15, 16-year-old. It was God. God was the cause behind the cause. So that's where the story begins in Daniel's life. This is Daniel's perspective. This is his understanding that even a foreign heathen king is under the influence of God. And that it's God who disciplines his people and brings them to the point of crying out once again. We see that over and over and over in the first covenant scripture. That's why he raised up prophets to remind them, whoop, it's time to come back. You people have strayed too far. It's time to return to the Lord. He did it over and over and over. But in Daniel's life, as a young man, there was such a foundation of trust, of knowing, of believing these things, that it was God who was sovereign and it was God who released the king of Israel into the hands of a heathen foreign king. And he finds himself in that context for the rest of his days. Come on. God was the cause behind the cause. Now here's the thing, beloved. God did not give Daniel peace in the midst of this. Daniel's right understanding of who God was gave him peace. God didn't give Daniel peace. He didn't mysteriously and magically just lay peace on Daniel to walk through all that he was walking through. Daniel's understanding of who God was, his nature and his character, was the government of peace in his life. God was overall, and God was good. I have no problem with God's sovereignty as long as he's good. Hello? If he's not good, I'm scared as hell. Come on. But he's good. And he does good. He's got a storehouse of goodness. <clears throat> so I can learn to trust his sovereign goodness. We're going to get there, so hang in. Hang in. Daniel was to be made a servant. Come on. Taken from his land, family, brothers and sisters, friends, murdered, slaughtered, his city burned to the ground, taken away to become a servant, and his understanding is God's the cause of that, so I must now see the dimension of God's sovereignty in my call to be a servant. Hmm. So this long test of serving in Daniel's life groomed him 
to become the ruler. You'll never rule over anything unless you learn to submit and surrender. You won't even rule over your own life. <laughs> Daniel's belief, the structure of his faith, it worked through every situation he faced. When crisis came, my God is over all, and my God is good. And we know the life of Daniel, we know the things he had to face. We know that the king brings him forward and says, look, I had this dream. You need to interpret this dream. And we know he does. Listen to what he says. Daniel says, it is he who changes the times and the epochs or seasons. He removes kings and he establishes kings. Who's he talking to? The king. You don't think there's just a measure of the fear and all of that. He's speaking directly to the king. But it's God who establishes kings, and it's God who brings them down. Daniel's unfolding revelation of who God is is astounding. As a 14, 15, 16-year-old, he understood that God was most high. Most high God. Daniel understood that there was a progression of this revelatory understanding. Because, listen, beloved, we're not going to figure God out. <laughs> He's greater than our ability to figure him out. But Daniel's view was constantly changing in light of those two things, that he's overall and that he's good. That was the context for Daniel, and everything else came revelatory as a result of that. Think about it. I'm going to skip to the end. What was Daniel shown at the end? The end of the age. Are you kidding me? He was shown the very end of the age. Why? Because Daniel connected himself to God's sovereignty and his goodness. And every aspect of his life filtered that revelation into every circumstance. So you know what Daniel was actually doing when he's in the lion's den or he's having to interpret a dream or he's being thrown in the, to the furnace? He's pulling God's sovereignty into every situation. He's saying, my God is most high God. I will not bow down to lesser despots and kings. Come on. <clears throat> so Daniel's view of God was constantly changing and growing. So he goes from the God of heaven. That was his first revelation. He's the God of heaven. He's ruler over the unseen. To God of my fathers, the ruler of my ancestors, to God of gods, ruler over others, most high God, ruler over all the earth, to finally my God. Oh, my God. And then was shown the end times. Wow. Come on, beloved. Great and awesome God, ancient of days. Son of man, even Messiah, he was shown the revelation of Messiah. <sighs> Come on. This is what Daniel lived. Daniel 4, 25 and 26. The Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind. And bestows it on whomever he wishes. It is heaven that rules. Will you highlight that passage in your Bible? Would you? It is Daniel chapter 4, 
verses 25 and 26, the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. It is heaven that rules. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it on your mirror. We need to be reminded of that every day. It is God who rules. Dave, uh, Daniel's life was extraordinary, but as it, was, it was extraordinary because he understood that God is most high. So when a foreign king says, bow your knee, sorry, can't do that. I can't do that. My God is ruler over all. In the late 1800s, there's a man by the name of Peter Dunn, and he coined the phrase, he came to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Late 1800s. I'd say he was a little ahead of his time. He came to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> Probably didn't make him very popular. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed in all the world. There's a particular word in the New Testament that I think is important for us as we understand the context of the days in which we're living. We're living in the days of Noah. Here's what we're in need of. Hebrews 10.36 For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God you may receive what is promised. So there's two words in that sentence I want you to know. Endurance and promised. On Wednesday, we meet every Wednesday as a staff for a time of worship and intercession and interaction and, communi and communion. And Pastor Lynn had picked the scripture out of Luke and in that context is wait for what the Father has promised. And I got so captured by that statement. We have a Father who fulfills his promise, but there's an active participation on our part. We have to posture our heart to wait, to trust, to rest, and to engage with what he's saying and what he's doing. That's exactly what Noah had to do. It's exactly what Daniel had to do. He had to settle the peripheral issues so that every aspect of his life could be empowered and affected by the sovereignty of God. You with me? So we have need of endurance. This particular word in the New Testament, we know the New Testament was translated into Greek. This particular word is the word hypomony. It means cheerful endurance. What? Wait a minute, God, let me, let me read this back to you, Lord, because I'm not sure you understand that there's hardship involved here. I, I know that... I know that you sent the rain on Noah, but do you understand how much he was mocked? Lord, do you understand that even his family mocked him? Do you understand how challenging it must have been for him to live a hundred years in that context and still be faithful, build the ark, do what he was asked to do and get in the ark and close the door? 
before it started. <laughs> we have need of cheerful endurance. Why would we be cheerful in our endurance? Because of who he is. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. The hope of glory. He is the hope of glory inside of us. How could Daniel face the lion's den? My God is above all, and he's good. So every aspect of his life is filtered through that understanding. So you and I, we have need of endurance. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, who are the witnesses? It's all the ones that have gone before who've lived this life. Let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Trust me when I tell you, you walk out that door, you have to make a choice. Because there are cords of sin that are just waiting to entangle you. Let us run with endurance, cheerful endurance, the race that is set before us. So, I want you to turn to 1 Kings, because I want to talk for a minute about Elijah, 1 Kings 17. You will not figure God out. You have to settle some issues that God is sovereign. We don't know much about Elijah before he shows up on the scene. All we know is where he's from. He's from a region. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead. That's all we know. But he shows up on the scene... But what we do know is that he's not afraid to speak the word of the Lord. That's what we know. Listen to what he says. And he says to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, he lives. Before whom I stand, surely there will not be either dew nor rain for the, these years except by my word. Wowzers. That is either way beyond arrogance or it's touching the sovereignty of God. And then the word of the Lord comes to him after that little moment with the king and says, Go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Kareth which is east of the Jordan. So Elijah makes his way down to this valley next to this brook. Now he's just prophesied what? No rain, no dew until I say. Okay, that's the context. So he doesn't live outside that word. He lives inside that word, right? Go away. Turn eastward, hide yourself by the brook Kareth, which is the east of the Jordan. It shall be that you will drink of the brook. Praise the Lord. I just prophesied, you know, no dew, no rain, but I'm going to have my full at the, at the brook. <laughs> I love this. So we went... And he did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Kareth, which is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. Beloved, that is, that is not symbolic. Before Elijah could fulfill the word, he had to trust. He had to know how 
much God was actually God. Follow me. Follow me. He had to know that God was able to provide and perform whatever was necessary for him to fulfill the word. You with me? Now, this is just me, but I don't want ravens feeding me. They're dirty, nasty, demonic birds. Every reference to ravens in the scripture refers to darkness and demons and demonic stuff. Is God sovereign? He's sovereign. Which means he can take those nasty, dirty, demonic creatures called ravens and he can send them to the man of God to literally feed him. And Elijah had to have that experience before he could confront the evil of Ahab and Jezebel. He had to hide out. He had to hide out by the brook. And he had to be fed by these grotesque birds. I mean, I don't know about you, but... Sometimes my imagination gets really captured by some of this stuff, and I'm thinking, okay, I've been to enough movies. I got enough cinematography stuff going on in my head. What does that look like? Ka-ka, ka-ka, you know, when they come down and spit out a piece of bread. You know, I'm like, <coughs> I'm already gagging on the inside, thinking I'm going to eat that. Oh, my gosh. That takes a lot of trust. Disease. You see, beloved, this is real practical stuff. Every aspect of Daniel's life was met head on by his understanding of God's sovereignty. Elijah, the man of God, the prophet of God, the man of power for the hour, he had to know how much God was really God. You go say this to the king, that it's not going to rain, nor is there dew going to be on the ground until I say so. And then now go hide by this brook. That's his first assignment. Go hide at this brook, drink from the brook, and let the ravens feed you. What happened at the brook? The influence of his word came to pass. The brook dried up. <laughs> So now he's living in the very center of the context of the word he's given the king. The brook is dried up. What does he have to do now? Not yet. Not yet. He's still got lessons to learn. Where does he go from there? To the widow. In that day and hour, there was no lesser individual on the planet than a widow. There was no poorer individual on the planet at that time than a widow. And God is telling him from ravens to a widow, you're going to follow me. I feel it right now. You see, we, we want the miraculous. We all want the miraculous. We don't want to have to trust like this. We want things to happen, but I want them to happen in my comfort zone. I want them to happen in a way that I can just smile my way through it. You know, oh, that's so nice. I like that. That's not how life works. It's not how our Father works. We know that Elijah's life was called to be a disruption to a dark, evil presence that took two individuals to give themselves over to who happened to be in authority, Ahab and Jezebel. It takes an Ahab to release a Jezebel. 
She didn't just happen on her own. She's nurtured and groomed by an Ahab. And there's a whole lot in there we could talk about, but for another time. Because I want to focus our attention on God's sovereignty. So we know that after the confrontation, after all that Elijah had seen, what does he do? He runs away because Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you. You did this to my prophets. I'm coming after you. And we see Elijah running as far and as fast as he can run until he is absolutely exhausted. I mean, I've been to Israel many, many times. I've been out in the Judean desert. I don't know how you do that and live, how far he ran. But he did. And he finds himself totally exhausted. Does God abandon him? No, he does not. What does he come to do again? To feed him and to bring him drink. That's how good he is. And then he says and does something for Elijah so that he understands this context of how God speaks. What does he do? He sends an earthquake. He sends a whirlwind. And he sends a fire. And the scripture says, but Elijah didn't hear the voice of God in any of those things. How did he hear the voice of God? As a whisper. Do you want to know why God doesn't yell? God doesn't yell because to yell means you're competing with other sounds. God does not compete with other sounds. And the reason he wants to whisper is because you have to come close enough in proximity to hear. You with me? You have to come close enough to who he is and what he wants and the desires of his heart so that you can hear the whisper. Here's the deal. From the whisper to the promise is the issue. From the whisper of his voice to the fulfillment of the promise is this little thing called your life. Daniel's life, Elijah's life, Norm's life, Ed's life, it doesn't matter. It's what we do in between the whisper and the promise. So we have need of endurance, right? We have need of cheerfully acknowledging, receiving, and understanding that he is most high God and he is in control. Hello. So here's how we live in the context of the whisper and the promise. And I want you to, I want you to follow me because we only have 25 minutes. Is your blessed assurance good for 25 more minutes? Praise the Lord. In this context of time between the, the whisper and the promise, we're learning, we're learning to move from principle to paradox. And I want to I wanna define what I'm talking about, from principle to paradox. Principle is a fundamental truth or proposition that serves as the foundation for a system of belief. That's the principle. Paradox is a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true. <laughs> I'm going to read that one again. Paradox means a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be a may prove to be well-founded or true. So we're learning to move from the principle to the paradox. 
So here's the principle. Two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. That's the principle, right? So there's no mistaking this for wine. Or is there? Do you have any idea how large the vats were that Jesus turned water into wine? You think they were this big, that big? If you've ever been in the land and you've ever seen remnants or pictures of them, they are ginormous, ginormous vessels. And he took the principled properties of two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen and made them the finest of wine. Moving from the principle to the paradox. Listen, the principle is that lakes are made for fishing and boating and skiing, not for walking. <laughs> or are they? See, we think that the only time a human being has ever walked on water was Jesus. That's not true. Back in the 70s, there was a move of God in Indonesia. Did you know that? There was a move of God in Indonesia, and there was a book written of the actual account of what took place. And it's called Like a Mighty Rushing Wind. I know it's out of print. I'm not sure you could even find it. But in that account, two things happened to these precious believers who were literally at times running for their life because whether you know it or not, Indonesia is the largest Muslim nation in the world. And they found themselves at a fast-moving river, and it was children from like 14, 15, 16 down to very young. And the, the ones that were pursuing with weapons and clubs and sticks who were going to murder them because they were children of believers... They had a decision to make. Do we go into this river and none of them knew how to swim? Or do we face what's coming? And the first one made the choice and stepped into the river, except he wasn't down, he was on top. And they began to run across the top of this river over to the other side. <laughs> the principle is... That should not happen. The paradox is that it did. Hello? <laughs> You're looking at me like that calf in a new gate. Learned that from my spiritual father. I don't even know what it means. Can somebody explain that to me? What is a calf in a new gate? Just doesn't know where it's at. Is that what it is? Never seen it before. That's right. Kind of like me in the middle of the night, where's the bathroom? I can't see it. <laughs> the principle is that prison doors stay locked. Or do they? The principle is that a couple of fish and a couple of loaves will feed two to three to four people, not 5,000. Do you understand what I'm saying? We quote this passage of scripture all the time. All things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. Is that what your Bible says? Actually, it's not. That's not the scripture in its fullness. You know what your Bible says? And we know that all things work together for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. The principle is that we know. The principle is that we know. The paradox is the all things. Let me explain. I have a dear friend who has been a spiritual mentor and uh, 
just a dear, dear friend for many, many years. He finds himself now in a wheelchair with a disease that only uh, has affected Jewish people. And out of uh, all the population of Jews, the percentage of those who actually get this is very, very small. And it is uh, a disease that affects the motor muscles. And so the first thing that he began to notice was that when he was walking, his foot would drag. That was the first thing he noticed. The second thing he noticed was he could no longer do this. It affected his, these muscles so he couldn't lift his legs. So now he's in a wheelchair, a motorized wheelchair, but the progression of the disease has stopped. So for most who have this disease, the muscles in the chest and neck do the same thing so that they can't breathe or swallow and they end up passing away. His progression has stopped, but he is living in a wheelchair, a motorized wheelchair. He can stand up, but he can't really walk. And I've had some moments with the Lord over this. I've had prophetic dreams where I've seen him come out of that chair and I wake up and I begin to pray and I begin to ask and I begin to declare that he comes up out of that chair. Hasn't happened yet. But I've had some moments with God where I've said, look, Lord, you raised my wife from the dead. She was pronounced dead and she sits right there. Your kindness and goodness to me was overwhelming to do that. And yet my dearest friend sits in a wheelchair, not able to move. He can't, and you just have to know this guy is so full of life. At 70 plus years old, he could outdo all of us. I mean, we bought this piece of property in Cyprus in the mountains and he would traverse that property. He would just wear me out. And now he's in this wheelchair. I don't understand the ways of God, but this I know that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. I have to place my lack of understanding of how all this works into the knowing part. Otherwise, I begin to judge what I do not know. And I leave myself vulnerable to disappointment and bitterness. And it begins to ruin my life. Bitterness is as rottenness to the bones. You with me? I don't know why some people live and some people die in COVID. I'm not smart enough to figure all of that out. But I have to step back and I have to make the declaration of Daniel that he is most high God that he is sovereign in his goodness and his goodness is not diminished because something has happened. Hello? Listen, beloved, we're moving into days of human history where literally we're going to see a third of the earth gone. The population gone, a third gone whether it's a pandemic or, or limited nuclear exchange, whatever it is, I don't know. But is that going to diminish the sovereign goodness of God? See, it's about your walk. It's about your walk. Daniel, walking with God through all of those situations and circumstances. Elijah having to physically walk out the prophetic word that he spoke and learn from God and trust that God would care for him and look after him in the worst possible ways. Come on. 
It's about our walk. Trusting in his sovereign goodness. Trusting in his ability to lead us and guide us and provide for us. All things, all things. I cannot wrap my mind around all things. You cannot diminish the word all. It's not lesser than, it's greater than. All things. People go through horrific situations. Lynn's brother just lost his wife, battling health issues that are life and death for himself. I don't understand it, but I have to trust and place my faith in that dimension of God is most high. And he's sovereign in his goodness. Listen, I want to make this statement and I want you to pay careful attention. The orchestration of the Lord doesn't come at your convenience. It comes in our obedience. The orchestration of the Lord in your life doesn't come at your convenience. It comes in our obedience. I want to finish by telling you how I know I'm supposed to be here in this room. And I have to start with my father. During World War II, my father served uh, in the infantry. He and his older brother both went in uh, to service at the same time. My father did his military training in uh, Georgia and uh, it was a paratrooper school there in Georgia. It's still there, Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, my dad came to the very uh, quick realization he was not meant to jump out of planes. I say yes and amen to that. You try to push me out of a plane, my butt's going to grow hands. I'm just telling you right now, there's, there's no way you're pushing me out of a plane. So he became a part of the infantry. He was a part of the 42nd Rainbow Division, which I most recently found out something that stunned me. My dad's military service began, uh, the 42nd Rainbow Division came up through Marseille, through France, and then up that way. They did not come through Normandy. They came through the, the backside. All I ever knew of my dad's military time was this, that there was a point when they were coming up through France that his brother was killed in the Pacific Theater. Have you ever seen the movie Saving Private Ryan? Okay, that's not my dad's actual story, but that's what happened. My, my dad's brother was killed in the Pacific, so they took my dad off the front lines uh, and made him uh, kind of a supply guy. He had to supply the team and the, you know, all of that stuff. So he spent the rest of his tenure in the European theater doing that. And all I ever heard my dad say was at the end of, of uh, World War II that one of his responsibilities was to uh, look after the Jewish people that were being liberated out of the camps. And that he uh, said it was like herding cats because they would come and they would uh, give them food and clothing, but they were there to help them with transportation, to put them on trains or vehicles to go in different directions. And he said during the night they'd all leave because they'd been in prison. They'd been in camps. They don't want another constriction. They wanted to go. So they would come, they'd get food and clothing, and in the middle of the night, they'd all be gone, and they'd wake up the next morning, where'd they all go? That's all I ever heard my dad say about that season of his life. Well, I found out most recently that the 42nd Rainbow Division was one of three divisions that liberated Dachau, the prison, Dachau. Has anybody ever been to Auschwitz or Dachau or any of them? Man, I'll 
I'll just tell you, it's, it's a horrible thing. It, it, will, it will move you deeply to see it and understand what took place there. I, I guarantee it. Uh, we've been to several many times. And uh, it's a sobering thing. So my dad never talked about any of that. Probably couldn't, you know. But they removed him from active duty so that he could be a supply to the Jewish people. That's step one. He finishes his European theater commitment. He comes back to the States. My mom is begging him to not uh, continue on in the military, but he wasn't ready to quit. And so they reassigned him to Alaska <laughs> because they felt at the time that Russia was the greatest threat and that they needed to prepare the troops to defend the Alaskan territory so that they wouldn't have a backdoor entrance into America. So they sent my dad and my mom and my older sister, who was just a baby at the time, just six months old, to Alaska. Now, this is in the, you know, uh, late 40s, early 50s. So it's not like they had, you know, North Face gear and, you know, they had crummy military gear. And so, you know, that whole experience was, you know, very, very challenging, very, very difficult. He was, uh, he left the European theater as a lieutenant, became a captain in Alaska, and was now, you know, had a whole company of men who were being trained in winter warfare to handle that front. And so as a part of one of their uh, training excursions, he had to load up his whole company on three different planes and as the last ones were getting on, he was making sure that, you know, everything was secure. And he's walking up the stairs to get on the plane. And a general pulls up in his car, gets out, yells at my dad, I'm on, you're off. I'm on, you're off. Well, what do you do as a soldier? Oh, hey, listen, I'm not going to abandon my guys right now. Look, we've been training. They expect me to be on this plane. No. No, you say, yes, sir, you're on, I'm off. So he comes down the stairs, the general, and gets his stuff. He goes up, gets in the plane. The three planes take off. Less than uh, six or seven hours later, they discovered that the lead plane had a malfunction. Because back in those days, they didn't have GPS. They didn't have all that. They would ping off the mountains so that they would know how to traverse in the, uh, the cloudy, you know, weather. And they found out that the lead plane had a malfunction in the ping. The first plane went into the side of the mountain, the second plane followed, and the third plane followed. All three of those planes went into the side of the mountain. And my dad was the only one out of his company who survived. I can't explain that, beloved. I stand here today because God spared my father not once but twice. Sixty-some years later, I'm standing along with my wife in the town square of a little place in the Czech Republic called Pilsen. And we had gone there on outreach to serve uh, the community and to minister in local churches. And I was preaching in a little Methodist church on this town square and just had an amazing time of blessing and encouraging them. And it was, my dad was still alive at this point. He's gone on to be with the Lord. But I remember calling and he was asking, so where, where are you this time? You know, he knew I traveled all over and he said, well, where are you this time? And I said, well, believe it or not, dad, I'm in this little, this little town called Pilsen in the Czech Republic. And he goes, what? And I said, yeah, I'm in this little, this little town. We've been ministering in this little method. He said, right there on the corner of the square. And I went, what? He said, yeah, the little Methodist church right there on the, the corner of the square in the city. And I said, yeah. I said, how'd you know that? He said, that's the last place I was in Europe before they flew me out. 
because the American troops weren't allowed to go into Prague because Russia had already entered in. So they stopped the American troops in this little village, this little town called Pilsen. So for whatever reason, my dad stood in that town as a liberator, and I stood in that town as one who carried the gospel, freedom in Christ. You can't orchestrate that unless you're obedient. You hear me? I stand in this room today because I'm obedient, not because I'm brilliant. Please don't ever confuse that. My brilliance wouldn't fill a matchbook, but my obedience is going to carry me. I walked in those doors almost three years ago, and I heard the Lord say, you're going to have a history here. I had no idea what that looks like. I already had history with this one right here and her husband and family, and I knew we were to serve them. That's what we started right here, serving them, walking with them. And then we got to know Lynn and Debbie, and now all of this. Beloved, it's our obedience that makes way for the Lord to orchestrate what's in his heart to perform. You with me? Not our brilliance, our obedience. So I fully trust that whatever is in the Lord's heart, that he is forming inside of us as we endure with cheerfulness, whatever hardship that may come will fill this house with hungry hearts that we will see families transformed, that we will see sons and daughters grow up in the admonition of the Lord, where they will take the stand. I believe we're going to learn more from this, this generation. Listen, follow your history. Follow biblical history. Every time there was a generation on the face of the earth that the enemy knew God was about to work through, what did he do? He tried to kill them off. The days of Noah, the days of, not Noah, sorry, the days of Moses, the days of Yeshua, yeah. it was the decree that went out. Well, we've had a decree in our nation now long enough. I believe there are evangelists, pastors, teachers, apostles, and prophets that are the we little ones that are being groomed. We, our assignment is to steward their life so that we can see them grow up and accept and receive the call of God. <laughs> and I say yes to that assignment. I say yes to that. Fill this house with that generation. Let them see the miracles of God. Let them hear the testimonies of transformation. Let them see the addicted and the afflicted come in and walk out whole and full of life so that they have something that cannot be taken from them. My children know that their mother was pronounced dead, but she's alive. They carry that. They carry that. Take a deep breath. <laughs> I know I've unloaded a lot on you this morning. But beloved, if we don't understand God's sovereignty... We'll get caught up in the disappointment of our circumstances. And we'll miss what God's actually doing in the all things. So, Lord, I just thank you this morning that you are so good and so patient and so kind that even when we miss it, you come back to feed us. Even even when we don't understand, you keep coming with the more that we need and are desperate for. Whew. Father, I ask for everything that's in your heart for this house. I ask, Lord, that you would remove every measure of debt that this house has. That this would be a debt-free facility that there would be the comings and goings of radical generosity that flows in and out of this house, that we can give and give and give and give to where our city will say, who are these people? Who are these people? Lord, I pray that you would teach all of us how to steward, 
how to steward the resources that you give us, that we would never hold back. We would never hold back. We would never withhold, but we would always be radical in our generosity. Lord, I thank you that there is so much you want to do. I pray for the release of healing mercies in this house where people have suffered under disease and hardship. Lord, I pray for the release of healing miracles. Healing miracles. It'll become the new norm. Thank you, Abba. Lord, we're most grateful today that you would allow us to gather again, that you would allow us once again to hear your word come alive in us. We receive it today, Lord. We say yes to your sovereignty and your goodness. Teach us, frame that understanding into the way we see life, do life, experience life, so that we can bring glory and honor to your name, the fame of your name, in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Ten months we've been doing this, beloved. Seems like we just started yesterday. It's only going to get better. It may get more challenging, but it's only going to get better. And we made, we made a decision at the very beginning. Hey, if only five of you came, we'd do this. <laughs> so guess what? The five became 50. And now let's see it grow and mature. You now become the catalyst for everything that can happen. You're now it. Tag. You're it. You're the testimony. You're the life that people are looking at. You're the ones that are saying, man, you're missing it if you're not a part of this. You're the ones. I don't have to promote anything. I don't have to push anything. This isn't about me. This is about the community called TCAB growing and maturing and becoming this bride who has intentionally made herself ready. That's what this is about. All right? Hallelujah. It's 12.04. Sorry, four minutes. <laughs> Everything should be set up. Let's go have fellowship around the table. Amen. Bless you.